Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, professor of obstetrics and gynecology, faculty of medicine, Mansoor University. Today I want to discuss with you a case scenario about infertility. Let us go. A 28-year-old woman married two years ago and has been trying to conceive without success. Her menstrual cycles are infrequent recurring every three months. Menstrual flow for three to five days and there is no dysmenorrhea. Her body mass index 23 and there has no history of her citizen. The sexual relation is normal and no history of sexually transmitted infection. Medical history reveals that she is under treatment of irritable bowel with metoclobramate. Metoclobramide, on the market is called Reglan or Brembran, in a dose of 10 mg per day. Semen analysis for the husband was normal. <clears throat> Both partners have no special habits. Okay, so from history taking, or from the case scenario here, she is in a childbearing age, 28, married two years ago, and her cycles are regular and infrequent, recurring every three months. Normal body mass index. No history of hirsutism. Sexual history is normal. Her medical history is important because she is taking certain drug, metoclopramide. And Semen analysis for the husband is normal and the post partners has no special habit like smoking or drug abuse or alcohol intake. Okay, the investigation done was hormonal profile. In day two, she did LIH, FSH, TSH, and testosterone and prolactin level in the blood. In day 21, she did serum progesterone to detect ovulation. Okay, what is the results? The results here, as you see in the picture, as regard LH and FSH and TSH and testosterone, all the results are normal. A wild prolactin, 45 nanogram per milli, which is high. Okay, so we have here elevated serum prolactin level. What about day 21 serum progesterone? It is here 4 nanogram per milli. Of course, if she is ovulatory, will be 10 or more nanogram per milli. So, we can say here there is an ovulation or ovulatory dysfunction. And from prolactin, there is hyperprolactinemia. So, this hyperprolactinemia may be the cause of ovulatory disorder. Okay. So, we wanna to reach the diagnosis of this case from the history taking and from the investigation done up till now and to know if any basic investigation also needed and lastly, the treatment of this case. So, what is the diagnosis of our case? Our case is, has normal body mass index, 28 years old, and has infrequent cycle, and the investigation detected an ovulation by day 21 serum progesterone, and also hyperprolactinemia by the elevated serum prolactin. So, we can say that our case is primary infertility, two years, ovulatory dysfunction, and associated with hyperprolactinemia, which may be the cause of ovulatory dysfunction. And what is the cause of elevated prolactin? In this case, maybe one of the causes is the drug intake, which is 
metoclopramid because this drug may be associated with hyperprolactinemia like other drugs which like antipsychotic drugs antidepressant drugs some antihypertensive drugs may be associated with or may induce hyperprolactinemia how this happen for metoclopramid it acts like dopamine antagonist and all of us know that dopamine has inhibitory effect on prolactin formation and the release in circulation so if drug has an antagonizing action on dopamine will result in increased serum prolactin so we can say the full diagnosis here primary for 32 years of a lateral dysfunction hyperprolactinemia may be due to metaclobramine use okay any other causes of hyperprolactinemia please lock to this table i collect the different causes maybe idiopathic and maybe also physiological physiological with nipple or breast manipulation or during the pregnancy hypothalamic or infundibular lesions due to tumor like craniopharyngioma trauma sarcoidosis and histocytosis or due to petiter lesion like prolactinoma and acromegaly please lock to this picture this is the hypothalamus this is the infundibular part and this is the pituitary anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary so any lesion affecting this area may cause hyperprolactinemia in the hypothalamic and the infundibular may be tumor this bluish one is the hypothalamus and this yellowish one is the infundibular part tumor or trauma or infiltrating disease like sarcoidosis or histocytosis or in the pituitary prolactinoma or acromegaly or maybe the cause of hyperprolactinemia may be systemic disease like hypothyroidism like chronic renal failure like liver cirrhosis or maybe due to medications like antipsychotic drugs like antidepressant drugs like drugs acting on gastrointestinal motility like uh, metoclopramid reglan or rembrandt like antihypertensive drugs like brabamil alpha methyl doba reserbin or opioids so still we need a basic investigation which is missed in this case which is hysterosalpingogram hysterosalpingogram is important to know the uh, the tubal patency and the what is the uterine cavity like slide or any intracavitary lesion so hysterosalpingogram as you see in the picture this is a normal hysterosalpingogram this is this ampoule on the left side is urographene we inject this dye urographene through cannula like this one called the urographene cannula metal cannula inserted through the cervix this part inserted through the cervix then by a syringe we inject this dye inside inside the uterus through the cervix to the uterine cavity as you see here this is the dye inside then the dye go through the right tube and the left tube then spillage will occur from the fimbrial end here and here inside the pelvis this is how the normal hysterosalpingogram lock of course if we inject the dye there is two types of dye urographene and the lipidol in the past we used the lipidol but it is associated with more anaphylactic reactions so in the recent years maybe the only used is urographene no more libido because it is less an anaphylactic reaction and it is water soluble so this is the instruments needed cascus ficlum volcillum single truth the multiple tools ring forceps to hold sponge and clean the cervix with antiseptic betadine 
or Bovidon ideal. Before insertion of the cannula, this part of the cannula inside the cervical canal. The syringe containing the diurographene is fixed here, in the other end of the cannula, and we inject in two sets. First, half injected first, then x-ray is done, then the rest of the dye is injected, and second film is taken, and after half an hour, the third film is taken to show the spreading of the dye inside the pelvis. This is another method to insert the dye inside using a caster, disposable one. In the right side here, this is a package, disposable. You can use disposable casco and the caster. Everything will be disposable, but it is expensive and not available in all centers. But the instruments here is sterilized by autoclave, so it can be used repeatedly after sterilization again. We have some picture here to let you see some abnormalities. Here is bilateral hydrosalmix, locks the distended terminal part of the tube due to fimbrial closure. So this is a bilateral hydrosalmix right and left. A wild in the right side picture here is unilateral hydrosalmix because the other tube is normal, but the right tube is dilated due to distal closure causing hydrosalbins. This picture show some filling defects here, disturbed inside the uterine cavity, distributed inside. This is the endometrial polyps. So filling defects, multiple small filling defects, this is endometrial polyps. On the left side here, this is a bicornet uterus or maybe septate uterus. How to differentiate between posts? Lock to this angle if it is up to use, it is more towards bicornet uterus. If it is acute angle, it is more towards septate uterus. However, you cannot swear that which one is the diagnosis. You should do combined hysteroscopy and the laparoscopy to differentiate between uterine septum and bicornet uterus. Look to this picture, please. This is the filling defect inside the uterine cavity, submucous fibroid. This is a filling defect due to submucous fibroid. So submucous fibroid is the only type of fibroid which can be diagnosed. Intramural or subsurus cannot be detect detected, of course, using hysterosalpingogram. But submucous, because it's a space occupying a lesion inside the cavity, so will appear like filling defect inside uterus like that. On the other picture here, there is multiple filling defects, irregular. This is due to intrauterine adhesion, what is called the Asherman syndrome. This is filling defects is due to intrauterine adhesion or Asherman syndrome. So let us go back to our case. Our case today, primary fertility with hyperprolactinemia and ovulatory dysfunction. And due to certain drug which caused hyperprolactinemia, so we, we should start our treatment by stoppage of the drug which caused hyperprolactinemia, okay, which is metachlororamine. Okay, stop the drug, then wait for six to eight weeks and test for ovulation again by day 21 serum progesterone and watch the patient for regulate regulation of the cycle, cycles becomes regular and recurring within the normal range, okay? If the cycle becomes normal, occurring with the normal range, and we did test for serum progesterone, day 21 serum progesterone, and there is ovulation, so everything is fine, so the condition will improve and pregnancy may happen at any time. But if pro prolactin is still high, you should give the patient drugs to lower down the serum prolactin, like promocryptin or cabargoline. Also, you may do induction of ovulation 
and the follicular using transvaginal ultrasound to be sure about the ovulation and to give the patient the time in the course the most important time during the cycle for ovulation so what about the drugs given to treat hyperprolactinemia we have bromocreptin and the cabergoline the tablet in, uh, in bromocreptin is 2.5 milligram given every day but we should start with a smaller dose so we give half tablet every day until the patient accustomed with this drug because it is associated with many side effects like gastrointestinal nausea and vomiting like postural hypotension and dizziness like drowsiness and the headache so it is important to give the patient small dose then for three days then increase the dose to one tablet every day containing 2.5 milligram for one month to two months what about the cabergolin it is uh, uh, 0.5 milligram two tablets only inside this jar so i'll give the patient half tablet 25 so 0.25 milligram twice per week so every three days i give the patient half of the tablet of this drug for one month to two months okay what about the side effects many side effects associated especially with promocryptin and sometimes the patient stop treatment because of the side effects like nausea the vomiting as we said drowsiness, headache, postural hypotension, dizziness. But on the other side, cabargolin is much less in these side effects. So many patients prefer to take this drug, cabargolin, because it is lower in side effects and can be given easily. However, some studies said that in high doses of cabargolin, four milligram or more may cause valvulopathy cardiac insult in the valve lesion causing valvulopathy so it is recorded in some reports however in a small dose there is no nothing about this problem this is the end of my lecture thank you i'm dr alam musbah professor of obstetrics and gynecology faculty of medicine mansoura university